Welcome back. We are on our fourth video from Unit 4 on the Atom. And we're talking about some dead guys. So let's continue with that conversation with Niels Bohr. And yeah, that was me, sorry. He does look a little bored in my mind. Uh, but he really probably wasn't boring because, okay, he was a scientist. So maybe he was a little boring. But he, despite all that, he made some great contributions to our understanding of the atom. Uh, one thing he did that was probably the most valuable was to realize, based on experimental evidence, that electrons were in energy levels. So that's very important. I want you to wrap your mind around that concept of energy levels. And not only that, the further an electron was from the nucleus, now this was based on, you should have watched Rutherford, and you now know you have a nucleus, a small nucleus relative to the whole volume of the atom, this, uh, and, the, and the electrons are moving around somewhere around that nucleus. So the further an electron was from the nucleus, the higher its energy, the greater it's, or more positive it is, the potential energy is. And this provided a great starting point for our current understanding. So he was absolutely correct. What irritates me about Bohr, and honestly, it's not really about Bohr himself. It's about elementary and middle school teachers who, and I think they've stopped that lately, have their students make models of the atom and you'll use hangers and styrofoam balls or marshmallows or whatever but the key is is if you just painted it a little bit differently it'd probably look like this you know uh, the sun and and the planets orbiting the sun and that is not how electrons move and you know unfortunately those models lead to misconceptions in people's minds for decades and so we really want to, you know, bury that one. So this was wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay, it was a nice try. You know, I don't fault Bohr for proposing it. I fault teachers who are still, you know, about 100 years later following through and, and giving that impression to young people. So, anyway, okay, I'll get off my soapbox. We'll move on. Schrodinger is a key one. Well, look at him. I, I love these pictures sometimes. He's, he's a wild one. It looks like he touched one of those, you know, little electricity balls where the current runs to your fingers. So Erwin Schrodinger, he was an Austrian physicist. And he wasn't the only one. There's going to be some really important people involved. There's a guy named Heisenberg that we'll talk about later. De Broglie, which we won't talk about at this level. But this group of people came up with the idea of a quantum mechanical model of the atom. Now, what they did is, and again, this is about using a mathematical model. Remember I said models can be pictures, words, math, diagrams, a lot of ways we can model things so that our minds can imagine what we can't always see. And what they did is they took the mathematics of waves, which are pure energy, no mass, and they applied that mathematics to the electron, which is a particle. And based on that, they came up with what's called a wave function. And we're going to talk a lot about that wave function. For now, what we want to look at is that the results were simply an ability to find the probability of finding an electron. So we're going to next unit talk about a, a model that narrows it down to a region in space where there's a 90% probability of finding an electron with a given energy. So we're gonna come back to Schrodinger. His contribution was pretty significant in the grand scheme of things. Now, what we're going to do is move on and let's refresh your memory on the components of an atom. And again, there should be some clues in here. Your positively charged particle found in the nucleus is called a proton. 
Now it has a mass in kilograms on the order of like 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. But instead we have a relative scale and we call that one atomic mass unit. It's really 1.000 something, but we'll just call it one atomic mass unit for our purposes. And it's given sometimes shown as that with a P with a positive sign. Other times it's shown with a charge of one on the bottom left and a mass of one on the top left would be another way to designate a proton that's in the nucleus. Now we've talked about that electron. When you take AP with me, notice I said when, not if, but when you take AP with me, you'll see that my notes are called the elusive little electron and, and, and other chemistry tales. Our electron is a light negatively charged particle very light, one, you know, 1800th of a proton. So compared to one AMU, we pretty much call it nothing. And uh, we give it the symbol E negative, or sometimes you'll see the symbol E with a negative one charge and zero mass. So we'd put the charge in the bottom left and the mass in the top left. And then finally, we have our neutral particle has the same mass, very, very close, same mass as a proton, but it is neutral. There's no electric charge associated with it, and that's called the neutron. Again, these are things that should resonate in your mind backwards someplace. You know, dig, dig back into the recesses of your mind, and I think you'll find that you, were, that you learned these things before. So it is neutral, so remember we put the charge in the bottom left and the mass in the upper left. So we call it also 1 AMU, very close to what the proton is. Now, um, atoms are always neutral. We'll talk about what happens when we change each of these particles, um, but the atoms are neutral particles, and what that means for an atom, you're going to have the same number of protons as you have number of electrons. Now, there will be times we can change one of these, um, but if it's considered an atom, we call it a neutral particle. Now, the atomic number, you'll see an atomic number on the periodic table. It's the smaller of the two. Sometimes put at the top, sometimes put at the bottom. Your key is you want to look for the smaller number. I think it's usually at the top, but you know there, there can be some people who do some different things, try to be creative. It's a whole number, right? Because it's a count. I'm not talking about significant figures here. It's a count. So because of that, it has to be a whole number. And this is probably one of the most important things that you'll come away with, with the, the um, atomic number and the number of protons. It is the number of protons represented by the atomic number that defines an element. In other words, if we change, that delta means change, if we change the number of protons, we are changing the nature of the element. And that only happens in nuclear decay or, or nuclear reactions. It's not always a decay, it can be a capture. But that's only nuclear reactions, and we'll see those much later in the year. Okay, now I want you to note something here. We're going to introduce two terms in this unit. The first term we're going to introduce is mass number. So the mass number is primarily a count. Now there, there is a subtle difference. It's not going to be an exact count like an atomic number but it's the number of protons plus the number of your neutrons. So protons plus neutrons equals your mass number. And we will usually rep represent it as a whole number. It's in actuality, sometimes you'll see uh, like uh, an isotope that you think is nitrogen 14 and we'll find out that it's 14.0018 or something like that. I just made that number up. But that's because for a couple of reasons, but primarily because the proton and the neutron 
aren't really exactly one. And so you'll sometimes be given this, but if not, and you see mass number, always simply add up your number of your pro neutrons plus your number of your protons. And that's going to be distinguished from the concept of atomic mass. And I, I want you to hold off on that. The atomic mass is what's on the periodic table. Now, if you notice on the periodic table, a large number of these have masses that are nowhere near a whole number. You know, if you're given a number like this, it's going to be pretty darn close to a whole number. But if you look on the periodic table, look at iron, for example. Iron's 55.85. That's nowhere near a whole number. And that's because it's the atomic mass that's on the periodic table. And there is a difference between atomic mass and mass number. They're not the same thing. And so we're going to move into that in our next set of videos as we start addressing what happens when we change the number of electrons, what happens when we change our number of protons. Okay, we saw protons, so we're not going to talk about protons anymore until we get into the nuclear chemistry chapter, but what happens when we change our number of neutrons. And so that will be our next series of videos, so until then, this is signing off.